therefore, this is a bad news chapter for old Nebuchadnezzar. He's not going to like it. So we've seen the first three chapters. The first thing they had to do is get rid of the Jude Judaism in the kids. And we saw that, right? And the second chapter, and even the third chapter, if you don't worship the big giant statue, you go into the fire pit. They have gone to great lengths from the beginning with diet and that kind of stuff, all the way to the ultimate worship, the big giant golden god, which was Nebuchadnezzar, or go into the furnace. In all three chapters, the, the young Jewish boys resisted and said, no, we can't do that, we won't do that. And with that, then they threw them into the fire pit and God rescued them all three times. So the fourth chapter now, we're going to get back to the cause of all this issue. And that is the king himself. So here we go, fourth issue. These kids, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. The people are dead. The few were taken into captivity. And they are being forced to forget their Judaism over there. And these young men refuse to do that. So now let's look at chapter 4. A king against the little kid. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the king. I like the way this goes every time. The king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth. Wow. That's, that looks good on your resume, you know. I am king to every language that live in all the earth. Uh-huh, right. May your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. This is coming off the last chapter. Remember when the kids were thrown in the fire. For his kingdom is everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. And I had a dream, and it made me very fearful. And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind that kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And the magicians and the conjurers, here we go again, the conjurers and the Chaldeans and the diviners and everybody else and their mother came in and I related to them my dream, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came before me, whose name is now Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God and in whom is a spirit of all the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery can baffle you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with this interpretation. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. For I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the very midst of the earth, and its height was very great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached into the sky. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and it was good, uh, it was good food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt amongst its branches. And all the living creatures fed themselves from this tree. And I was looking in the vision in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. And he shouted out and spoke as follows, Chop down this tree and cut off its branches, strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit, and let the beasts flee from it, and let the birds flee from its branches, and leave the stump with its roots in the ground but with a band of iron and bronze around it and the new grass of the field and let it be drenched with the dews of heaven and let them share with the beasts the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers. 
And the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high ruler is over the realm of all mankind and bestows upon it whom he wishes. And he sets over it the lowliest of men. And this is the dream which I and Nebuchadnezzar have seen. And now you, Belteshazzar, shall tell me its interpretation inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom are able to make it known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Jan Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was greatly appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. And the king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let this dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. For the tree you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached the sky and was visible to the old earth, and whose foliage was beautiful, here we go again, whose foliage was beautiful and fruit abundant, which was food for all, under which the beasts of the fields dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the very end of the earth. And in that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one descending from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave its stump with the root in the ground but with a band of iron and bronze around it. In the new grass of the field, let him be drenched with the dews of heaven. Let him share uh, with the beasts of the fields until seven periods of time pass over him. This, O king, is the interpretation, and this is the decree from the most high God, which has come upon my lord the king that you should be driven away from mankind and your dwelling be place will be amongst the beasts of the field and you will be given grass to eat like the cattle and drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you finally recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows upon it whatever he wishes. And in that the command was to leave the stump with the roots of your tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is God of heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case that there may be some prolonging of your prosperity. Now all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was walking up on the roof of the royal palace of all Babylon, and the king reflected and looked upon it and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence at my power and for the glory of my majesty? Now while, while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty. Has, this sovereignty has been removed from you and you shall be driven away from mankind and your place will be like the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like the cattle for seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is the ruler of the realm of mankind and it is he who bestows on whomever he wishes. Now immediately the word of Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began to eat grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dews of heaven until his hair had grown long like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I praised the most high God and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For it is his dominion and his everlasting dominion. His kingdom will endure from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or to say to him, what have you done? 
At that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began to seek me out. So I reestablished my sovereignty with surpassing greatness was added to me. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven for all of his works are true and his ways are just and he alone is able to humble those who walk in pride. Wow. <laughs> hey, cow face, come over here. <laughs> Eat some grass. They thought it was just jazz musicians that liked grass. <laughs> That's a little joke in there somewhere. <laughs> Never Knesset was doing it thousands of years ago. What do you think about this? Sometimes it takes a lot to get your attention. You know what? It does. And mostly, I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a sweeping generality, which I never do because if you do that, you're always wrong. Because the minute you say, well, everybody doesn't, well, there'll be one that says, no, I don't. But I'm going to go out here on a sweeping generality and say, you know, when we're trying to learn something, and especially the older we get, when you're trying to learn something, it gets harder and harder to teach that lesson to where you'll come to where, you, to where you'll believe it and say, hey, I think you're right, especially coming from a younger man. Uh, because why? Well, because we're old, we're set in our ways, so to speak, and, you know, we know better but yet we don't know better. And when we try to get taught to know better or learned, if you will, uh, we resist it in every possible way. I don't want to do that. I baked this cake this way for a thousand years and I'm going to bake this cake this way. Yeah, but there's a better cake you can make if you just do it this way. Well, no, I'm going to do it this way, even though it's not as good, it will, it's my way. Well, that's who we are as human beings because that's who we're taught to be. Uh, all our lives since the, cra since the cradle, we've been told, get up, do the best, make, you know, be first place, run faster, work harder, study longer, do this, do that, do that, become the best and you'll get the best jobs, you'll get the best girls, you'll get the best house, you'll get the best cars. And we've been told to do it that way. And uh, some people, become obsessed with that. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is no different. He wasn't always a king. He was a little kid once and he had to grow up. He had to learn how to do stuff. He had to, you know, build armies and build towns and build cities, which he did to the majesty of that one of them, the hanging gardens of Babylon became one of the great wonders of the world. Now, sadly, we don't have any pictures of that. I wish we did, but <laughs> pictures didn't exist in those days. But the stories that were told of those gardens and the stories that were told of the visitors that came to those gardens and the riches and the power and the pomp and the circumstance. You read some of that in history. I'm not talking about the Bible, but you read some of that in history of the great glory of Babylon. Its armies and its prestige and its majesty is simply off the charts. We could, we'd have a hard time matching it today, even with all our technologies. You see what I'm saying? So when you're in the midst of that and you build it and your hand had a, you know, a specific degree in it, and I imagine it was a lot like that when they were building the, the pyramids in Egypt, where the kings and the pharaohs looked at that and went, wow, I'm doing a good job here. And then after it was all done, they, they too would walk out on their balcony and look at all this incredibleness and say, I am the greatest guy in the planet, on the planet. Why would they do that? Well, because that's who we have been trained to be. Even the Bible says, you know, do your best. You're not going to be perfect, but do your best. Do what's right. Do what this. Do this. Do that. Even Jesus says, work hard. Do what you, whatever you've got to do, do it well. If you've got to do this for Caesar, do that for Caesar. But on the same token, if you're going to do this for God, do it equally, equally as well. See what I'm saying? So there is that part of us that wants to excel and become all we are. Here's four little Jewish boys. They were taken out in chapter 1 to Babylon. 
Oh, L-O-N. In this, this is a strange town to them. None of these kids ever went to Babylon before they were taken by the captivity. You know, they were little kids. They were children playing in the streets of Jerusalem or playing in the streets of Mamre or wherever, wherever they grew up. Taken to Babylon and they were taught the language. They were taught the, the customs. They were dressed appropriately and groomed. I mean, everything they knew of Judaism had to be put away if they were to serve into Babylon because uh, Babylon conquered them. They were the lords. They were the kings. They, were the, they didn't want any Jewishness around. So of these guys they brought back, they tried to rid them of all Jewishness. Well, chapter 2 again and chapter 3, what do you get? Well, what you get are extreme... How do you spell extreme? E-X-T-R-E-M-E. -E. Extreme measures to enforce and to destroy this Judaism. I mean, beyond what any of us can imagine, even to the point of death. They threw them in the fire. Now, the resistance to this, the boys said, no, we're not going to listen to your language. No, we're not going to listen to your customs. No, we're not going to dress like you. No, we're not going to eat all the fine wine and, and the fine meats of the king. We want vegetables and clean water. That's all we want. So right away, they said no to Babylonianism. Then, of course, no over here. And finally, no to the giant statue. We're going to make a new god who is, of course, Nebuchadnezzar. And you're going to worship him. They make the point here so that you, O oh king, shall know whether God saves us from the fire or not, I can't tell you. But I will tell you this, whether I live or whether I die, we will not worship you as king of this world. Because you're not. We know who we, we, know who we have worshipped. We know who we have served. And we're going to hang on to that. Of course, the king throws them in the fire. And the Lord does decide to save them. Well, you know, he comes out of this. And Nebuchadnezzar says, as king, that this God must be some kind of God. Because they don't even smell like smoke, let alone being burned up. It killed a bunch of his soldiers that threw him in there. Fire jumped out and got on them. Okay, now we're at chapter 4. What's the problem with chapter 4? Well, the problem with chapter 4 is just the same thing I just told you a minute ago. There's a little boy had been told his whole life to be strong, be better than everybody else, be great, be this, be that, be that. You'll get the best house, you'll get the best cars, you'll get the best girls, you'll get the best everything. If you're good enough and strong enough and work hard enough, You'll do it. Well, here he is, the king. He's standing over a bunch of beautiful cities. Ow. A bunch of beautiful cities that he built. It was all he, he, he. He's destroyed the nation that claims this oh so great God. Remember that? The Judaistic God, the God of Daniel, now Belteshazzar, if he was such a great God, then why did he let me destroy his people? See, he didn't understand that God destroyed his people, not Nebuchadnezzar. It was the Lord who let his people go into exile because they turned away from God. And when you go back in Ezekiel, and look at what they were doing at the time God destroyed them, you will understand why God destroyed them. And said, that's it. The remnant, the young children who hadn't gotten so ugly yet, they were preserved through Nebuchadnezzar 
and brought back to him in Babylon. However, God's compassion was perceived by this man as weakness. There's the difference. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a country song. There's a country song for everything. But there's a country song. Uh, I can't remember who it is. Travis, somebody, or Garth Brooks. They say they sing. You know, now as an older adult that I've learned, I thank God for unanswered prayers. You ever heard that song? He wanted the high school queen and he wanted the captain of cheerleaders and he, wanted, he prayed every night to God and make her mine. And I will never ask for nothing again. Didn't get her. And he didn't get her. <laughs> and he went back to the high school for a reunion or whatever football game and reunion. reunion and he ran into his old high school queen. Well, she wasn't so much a queen anymore. And then he looked at his wife, who was, wow, she was the queen of his life. And he looked at the girl, and he looked at his wife, and he looked, at, and he began to say, you know, I thank God for unanswered prayers. I prayed so hard for this woman. Now as I talk to her, and I see her, and her values has changed, and my values have changed, I would never even consider her now. And just because God doesn't answer doesn't mean he doesn't care. I'm sure these four boys were asking in their mind, Lord, why did you send us here? Well, here is, since your whole country is destroyed, and you're too young to plant and harvest and all that stuff, maybe I need to put you somewhere where you can live a good life and not die. So the mistake was not on the boys, quite the opposite. They're somewhat religiously or spiritually heroic. But on the point of this man here, he got a whole big old case of him. I am the shining star, and I like the way he says it three times in there. I am the Lord of all this and all that and this and that, and I built this and I did that, and I am Lord of every language, tongue and king and man throughout the whole of the earth. Wow. That's a pretty big guy, right? That's about as high up on the human ladder you're going to climb before you say, I'm just like God. You know, the Beatles said that once. I believe we're more important than Jesus Christ. Ooh. Mind if I step over here, Paul? John, you guys stay over there. And I'm not making fun of the Beatles. I know you love them. But that's who we are. When you get to be the best of the best, very easy to cross that line where you step into the shoes of the Lord and say, oh. Now you see, Tom, is that really what's happening here? Sure it is. Because that's who man is. Remember the Pharisees and all the trouble Jesus had with them? And he was the Son of God. And they were not going to let him be the Son of God because they were the representatives of God. They were the dispensers of grace. I'll tell you who gets God's grace. I'll tell you who gets the sins forgiven. If you measure up and if you pay up, I will tell you. And they weren't going to give that up any more than he was going to give up his kingdom. Ever! So God steps in and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you stepped over the line. I'm not important to you, even though you saw incredible things. Even so, you saw incredible things. Even though you saw, you know, my guys were stronger, better, sharper than your guys. I've tried to show you three times and now here we are in the fourth chapter and you know what? You're still stupid. That's when you go, does your mother know you're this stupid? 
You get frustrated. Jesus got frustrated with his boys. Men of little faith. How long am I going to have to show you? How long am I going to have to jump up and down for you? I sang, you know, I blew a flute. You didn't dance. I sang a dirge. You didn't weep. A to Z. Top to bottom. Left to right. I've done everything in the world I can show you. And you're still stupid. Wow. You see, knowing about God is just part of the, the, the equation. The other part is you've got to know about you. Faith starts off with knowledge, correct? Well, throughout the Bible it says it does. But this knowledge is not just about God. It's about you. You need a good awareness of God. That's true. Jesus says, abide in my word, live there. Address your, your, that's your address. Where do you live? I live in the Bible, the word of God. But somewhere in there, you've got to learn about you and how you and God might work together. Then you can make a careful decision. An honest decision. Only then. When you've assessed God, assessed yourself, and you've got the smarts, my reason came to me finally. It says that three times right there. Now I know, now I can decide. And that opens the door, finally unlocks the door to be able to live for God the way I promised I would in the first place. A lot of people promise this. According to the God's rule, very few make it. Jesus told a story once about a sower that went out and sowed seeds. Remember that one? Um, they, even the boys didn't understand it. They were sitting there saying, well, Lord, what does that mean? Does your mother know you're this stupid? What does that mean? A sower went out to sow seed. Well, the seed is the word of God. The sower was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, acting in responsibility to his Father's command. You are the soil. You are the soil where the seed went. Some of it got eaten up by Satan right away, fell on the rocky ground, never went anywhere, or on the asphalt, the paved ground. Some of it went to the rocky ground that liked it. Hey, this is good stuff. But never really invested themselves, never put any roots down, never figured out who God really was and who they really were. Were they strong enough a soil to hold such a God, to grow such a plant? You know, farmers, if you've ever grown anything, know this. You can have the best dirt in the world and put a seed in there, but if it's not the right dirt for that seed, what's going to happen? Oh, it'll spring up and then... It'll die. Why? Was the seed bad? No. Was the plant bad? No. Was the, the soil was wrong. Some things grow in a soft soil. Some things grow in a muck soil like celery. Some things grow in a hard soil that needs, you know, stability. Anyway, Jesus says that the earth and all who live therein and make this promise to live for God, 75% of them fail. That's the parable of that, that, that story. And of the 25 that does get a couple of plants in the air, even they were varied in that some produced 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. The 100 fold was very little of this 25%. Even the good soil varied. You know, many pastor has started off preaching and after a year or two of churches, a year or two of congregations, after 10 years of pastor killers trying to get them and run them off, they finally throw in the towel. There was seven of us at seminary that hung together. And the reason that brought us together is we were all from secular universities. We didn't go to, you know, Bible college, you. I went to Florida. Uh, Dave went to University of Pittsburgh. 
uh, Denny went to the University of Utah or somewhere out there. The point is, we all came together. We all dedicated ourselves to God. There's one still in the ministry to this day. I know this guy, and he's the one that you would thought would have dropped out first. Because he is a man that does not like inconvenience and trouble. 100%, I don't know about that, but I know that out of seven, one is still preaching today, that's me. Dave Panther was two of us, and five dropped out there. Dave went to about there, and he finally said, I had enough. He retired. He's too young to retire, but he retired. He says, I've, I've had enough. You know, I can be a mailman or something. Earn a living. So even the good soils reach their limit. And they say, I can't grow anything else. I'm tired. I'm done. Well, that's when God needs to come along like Jesus told a second parable. Every year I come to this tree and I don't find nothing on it. Well, let me dig around it. Let me put in some more fertilizer. Let me water it real good and see if we can't get this thing growing again. That's called retirement, but then you don't retire. You got to come back and do it a little longer. I'm not mentioning any names, but there's only one of the seven, the holy seven we call ourselves. It's very hard to get convince people, obviously as they get older, and more successful and more proud. It's why Jesus looked at guys like that and said, you know, it is so hard for rich, successful men to enter the kingdom of God. Do you know why? Because they are God in their minds. They don't see a need for a God God. They see themselves. They're blessed. They got everything they could possibly want. Why do I want to go to church and listen to that nonsense? Some guy up there talking about, you know, Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago. America didn't even exist 2,000 years ago. See what I'm saying? That's human nature, folks. That's not something that's just come upon us in this day and age. That's human nature. It's good to be the king, right? So what we say. It's not good to not be the king. So when you make it to kingship, what's the last thing you're going to do? Give it up. You know, the last thing you're going to do is give that up. So, God stepped in and said, Nebuchadnezzar, I tried, I tried, I tried, and you're just too dumb to realize that there's something bigger than you. Oh yeah? What is it? Well, I'm gonna let you think about it for a while. You're as dumb as a cow, so let's make you a cow for seven years. You run around on your hands and knees just like a cow does. You eat grass for seven years, seven years salad bar. <laughs> And in seven years, seven periods, harvests, seasons, whatever. Gosh, there's that number seven again. Why did you do that? Isn't that the three persons of the Holy Spirit and the four corners of the earth? I mean, he is the king over every language and every man that lives in the whole blessed world, right? Of all the years, he could have made it five. He could have made it ten. Seven. I think God's got the greatest sense of humor in the history of the world. I just took, what'd you do today, son? This is God talking to Jesus. You know, before Abraham was, I am. What'd you do today? I took the greatest king in the whole world, turned him into a cow for seven years. That's got to be funny. I don't care who you are, that's funny. <laughs> Good job, son. Good job. Coming years later, Reason returned to him, and what did he become aware of? He ain't all that. He ain't all that. Well said. He says, you know, I'm, I hope nobody saw me as a cow. But he says, for 
God's dominion. And when my reason returned to me, I praised the Lord Most High, praised and honor Him who lives forever. For He is the dominion, and His dominion is everlasting. His kingdom endures throughout every generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are according to Him. He does according to his will as the host of heaven amongst all the inhabitants of the world. No one can ward off his hand when he says he's going to do something. And no one can even say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and my splendor was restored to me by the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. As Chuck so eloquently put it, I ain't all that. When my reason returned to me, I realized there is a God. And somehow these four kids we brought back here know about it. Somehow they tried to teach me, not once, not twice, not three times, but God himself showed me by making me a cow for seven years. You think he's got it yet? We'll see. But we'll have to wait till next week. All right? Oh, next Sunday there is not any Sunday school because it's a cook-off Sunday and vacation Bible school and cook-off. Folks, I'm telling you one more time, this Bible school... See if you can get folks. Talk to them. Tell them that it's going to be wonderful if we. Carol would like to see 30 kids there if we can get them, but that's her goal. She's got about 20 to 24 signed up. Not signed up, but said they would come. But you know whether they do or not, we don't know. So get Laura on those kids across the street. Get Janice on those, her nieces and nephews. Get everybody. Get on somebody. And bring them in. It's not going to be a junky little thing. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be pretty awesome, as far as I understand. All right? So let's get out there and grab kids.